My name is Christine Zananti. I just want to thank you for watching this video today. Our hope at Victory Church is that these messages inspire you and challenge you and help you grow in God. So thanks for watching and I hope this really blesses you today. So uh, this morning we are going to continue our message series on Solomon, the man who had it all. Now last week, uh, Pastor Lou, he started out the series talking about the warnings that David had given his son Solomon before he took over the kingdom. If you weren't here last week and you want to hear the first message of this series, you can go to our website and click on latest teaching and hear that online. But this week we're going to talk about Solomon's wisdom. Look at your neighbor and tell him you need wisdom. <laughs> and specifically, <laughs> specifically godly wisdom okay godly wisdom versus worldly wisdom that's what we're going to discuss today you know John Wayne he's a really old actor some of us in this room my dad used to watch him John Wayne is credited for this life for this line life is hard it's harder when you're foolish and isn't that the truth he actually said stupid but I didn't want to say that <laughs> Let's flip that statement around into something positive. Life is hard, but it's easier when you have God's wisdom. Solomon is now the new king of Israel, but he is young, and he doesn't really know what he is doing. Have you ever been in that situation? Maybe you're in a new position, a new job, become a new parent, you know, something new in your life, and you're nervous, you're scared, you're like, how can I even do this? I don't even, I've never experienced this before. Well, that was Solomon. He, he was in a new position and he was a young leader. And so he was nervous about this. And uh, it's important, any job is important, but this job to be the king of Israel at that time was huge because God himself appointed him. And I want to read, start reading from 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 to 15. And we're going to read about how Solomon asked for wisdom from God. Starting in verse 5, it says, At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Now, if, think about that. If God Almighty came to you in a dream tonight and said, ask for whatever you want, whatever. It doesn't matter. Now, this is God talking. He can do anything. That would be an amazing question, right? How many of you would love that? I, I would love that. Like, man, you're going to ask me whatever you want, he says. And this is the God of the universe talking, and anything is possible with him. Verse 6, Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne to this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong for who is able to govern this great people of yours. This scripture right here gives you an insight into Solomon's heart, what's in his heart. He is so humble. He is so kind. He is so willing to do whatever God wants him to do. He reminds you of his father David, doesn't he, in this way. You can hear his concern about his age. He said, I am very young. And really, we know that Solomon 
meant he's young and, ex and inexperienced. He was of the age where you could become king. But what he means by that is I am very young in this, in this venue, in this leadership, and I am very inexperienced. And he is worried about the amount of people that he's put in charge of, and he doesn't know quite what to do, even in regards to government and ethics and morality and all of these things. So he asked God for a discerning heart, wisdom. Out of everything he could have asked for, he chooses wisdom to lead. Okay, now watch this. Let's continue. Verse 10. The Lord was pleased with Solomon, with what Solomon had asked for. So God said to him, since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice. I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke and he realized it had been a dream. Listen, God is so pleased with Solomon's request. Did you know that you can impress the heart of God with even your prayers? You can impress the heart of God we can please the Lord by having a mindset that doesn't always just think about ourselves. Solomon was taking very seriously this position and the holiness of this moment in his life. He wanted to do his very best, but he knew that his, his own mind and his own experience was not enough. And so he asked of God for his wisdom. That's a smart man. All of us need wisdom in our lives. Wisdom in decision making. Wisdom to lead our own lives. Wisdom to navigate relationships and situations that come into our lives. Here are a few things that this young man knew that we all should learn. The first one is that God's wisdom begins with a surrendered heart. It begins with a surrendered heart. You know, after years of leading the kingdom, Solomon actually wrote this. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. He said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, it is the starting point to become a wise person. Understanding God's ultimate authority in our lives is essential to receiving his wisdom in our decisions. Solomon became a wise ruler because he was surrendered to the Lord and the Lord's authority over his life. He feared God. He feared the job and the, and the responsibility in front of him. He respected the position and he revered the holiness of that moment. In order to even understand godly wisdom, you must have the fear of the Lord. The problem is many times, many people want God's wisdom, but they don't want his authority. And that is so true. We want his wisdom. We'll take the blessing, but we don't want to submit to what God wants. It doesn't work that way. We have to have a surrendered heart and humility, just like Solomon did before him, and then the Lord will work on our behalf. Wisdom begins with a surrendered heart. The second thing is that God's wisdom is higher than man's wisdom. Now, I want you to tell your neighbor, God is smarter than you. <laughs> He's, believe it or not, <laughs> he is smarter than us. He is wiser than us. He is all-knowing. He is everywhere at once. Trust me, he, his wisdom is higher than ours. All you have to do is turn on the nightly news to see that man's wisdom is filled with weakness. 
and the inability to really handle situations. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19 says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. It's foolishness. Without exception, human wisdom elevates the self and it lowers God. It elevates the self and it lowers God. It always, no matter how seemingly sincere and objective and scholarly, it caters to human self-will, pride, fleshly inclinations, and independence. Solomon had a huge job in front of him, leading this nation. Some of these people had turned from the true God. Some of them were worshiping idols. Some of them were doing things that were not right. And he knew the mindset of the people and the focus of the people needed to be Godward. He asked for the ability. I love that part where he asked for the ability to discern right from wrong. He didn't want to rely even on his own knowledge to do that or his thinking. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is really about facts. It's the things that we acquire through study, research, uh, investigation, experience, observation. But wisdom is the ability to discern and judge which aspects of that knowledge are true, which are right, which are lasting, and a proper course of action for your life. There's a difference there, a big difference. People can be book smart and even have a, have a lot of experience in their lives, but have absolutely no wisdom or discernment on how to lead their life. An example of that is knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad, <laughs> right? Knowledge is knowing that Eating pizza and fries every day will make you unhealthy and fat. Wisdom is actually eating vegetables and healthy food every day. Solomon doesn't want to rely simply on his own experience or even his own knowledge that he has acquired. Trust me, he was a smart man. He knows he needs something more than that to rightly govern and do his job well. Solomon asked for the ability to discern. Look, let's read that again. 1 Kings 3, verse 8. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count in numbers. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and distinguish between right and wrong for who is able to govern this great people of yours. God's wisdom, folks, is higher than man's. Even back then, Solomon saw a lack of wisdom and morality in the culture. It was blurred, and it, it was not clear even with what was right and what was wrong. Sometimes I think in our society, Christians give up the struggle, and they just give in to worldly wisdom around them because it's easier. You know, everybody else is doing it. The crowd is following it. But the bottom line is, it may be easier for the moment, but it's not wiser. It's never wiser. And in the long run, you end up regretting the decisions that you made. Just because something is considered a ge the general consensus of a population does not make it wise. It doesn't make it wise. The Bible also warns that there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is destruction. General consensus of a population does not make it wise. I mean, just look at Nazi Germany. There was a general consensus that stemmed from Hitler and his leadership that infected German youth that basically turned into the Holocaust and one of the greatest tragedies this world has ever seen. You know, many years ago, slavery here in America was generally accepted. We consider that horrible today. Horrible now. Societal conformity does not equal wisdom or morality. Right. Let me say that again. Societal conformity does not equal wisdom or morality. Just because everyone else believes a certain way or thinks a certain thing does not make it wise or make it moral. 
So what does God's wisdom look like? What does it look like? James chapter 3, verse 17 tells us, but the wisdom from above is first pure. It's first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. I wish we had time to go into every single one of these, but we don't. But just very quickly, pure, it is unstained by sin. It is untainted. God's wisdom is untainted by sin. So it's pure. It's peaceable. It brings peace to others. It's gentle, not aggressive and demanding. Open to reason. It's not stubborn or arrogant, but still holds to truth. Full of mercy and good fruits. It's sympathy that moves you to action. It's impartial, which means it's free from prejudice or favoritism. And sincere, meaning it's without hypocrisy. It's without hypocrisy. When you're operating like this, you know it is in God's wisdom. And can I be honest? All of us need to ask him for this in our lives every day. It is impossible for us to live this with our own human weaknesses every day of our life. The third thing that we can learn from Solomon is God's wisdom is needed in decision making. Early in Solomon's reign, he faced uh, a very difficult judgment. There were two women who were arguing and crying over a child. The two women lived in the same house and they both had infant children. One of the babies died in the night and the woman whose child died, she switched her child with the other lady's baby. Then in the morning, the mom whose child was still living was left with a dead baby in her arms. So basically, one of the women was a liar and a thief. But the case, the case comes before the king, and it's up to the king to decide who the true mom is of this living child. Now, you gotta remember, back then, there was no DNA tests, there was no blood tests, there was no mouth swab, there was no fingerprinting. I mean, you can be identified in any number of ways now in our society. But back then, there was nothing. Here's Solomon looking at two women he's never met before, and they're crying because each of them says, this is my baby. Can you imagine having to make that decision? What would you do? What would you do? That would be a very scary thing. And so here's his answer. God's wisdom. 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 24 to 28. Then the king said, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword for the king. He then gave an order, cut the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. The woman whose son was alive was deeply moved out of love for her son and said to the king, please my lord, give her the living baby, don't kill him. But the other said, neither I nor you shall have him, cut him in two. Then the king gave his ruling. Give the baby to the first woman. Do not kill him. She is the mother. Can you imagine that kind of judgment down in Boston Courthouse? <laughs> I don't know, man. He got, he got stuff done. Imagine that, though. It was obvious after doing that dramatic example who the true mother was, right? It was obvious. The real mother is not going to harm her baby for any reason. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 28 says, When all the people heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in awe because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. I mean, you would never naturally think of that as the way to judge, but it worked. Listen, even in the most impossible decisions in your life, where you are so confused and you don't know which way to go, ask God. God for wisdom. James 1 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given you. But listen to this. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should expect, he should not receive anything from the Lord. 
Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Anybody can get wisdom from God. You just need to ask. But when you ask, you believe that God will give you what you have asked for. Receiving godly wisdom, wisdom has an element of faith. Your faith will be stretched when you have to rely on God's wisdom. Let me say that again. <laughs> Your faith will be stretched when you have to rely on God's wisdom. Why? Because his wisdom is higher than yours. And when he gives you wisdom, it may not make sense to you. But then the question is, am I going to be obedient? That, that's the question. I remember many times in our lives being in difficult financial situations. You know, we were urban missionaries for a long time. Uh, in the inner city of Philadelphia, Miami, uh, Boston. We, we uh, re restarted that church with only five people. And God, you know, many times I, we'd only have so much money in a week. And I, it was a stretch for me to give to the Lord, to give a tithe or to give that offering that I always would give especially when money was tight. And it didn't make sense to me. Why should I give money to God's kingdom when I can't put food on my table this week? But you know what? My husband and I, many years ago, even before we entered ministry, said we will do things in God's wisdom. Even if it doesn't make sense, we're going to be obedient. We're going to do what the word says. And you know, throughout our whole life, we have never lacked we have never lacked. God has blessed us. He has blessed our children. We, we have done everything that we've ever wanted to do. We travel everywhere. We see, I'm telling you, God would make the bills smaller. He would send money in from different places when we needed it. It always showed up. And obviously, neither of us are starving, right? So, you know, I'm telling you, <laughs> God's wisdom works. It works, folks. We, we decided not to rely on our own wisdom, but we said we're going to do what the word says. We saw miracle after miracle. In decision making, don't just take matters into your own hands or do what everybody else is doing. You need to stop and pray and say, Lord, I'm willing to hear your wisdom. I'm willing to hear what you say and then have the faith to follow through. The last thing about God's wisdom is that it is eternal. It's eternal. It's unending. See, you and I, we're, we're finite. We have a limited time. We have limited resources, limited mindset in, in so many ways. But God is eternal, and his wisdom is eternal. I'm going to hold to that. I want some of that in my life. 1 Kings chapter 4 says God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand of the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. The fruit of wisdom in your life grows over time. If you're a young person here today, can I encourage you, please seek the wisdom of God in your life. Don't look to worldly wisdom or worldly uh, situations. You need to seek God's wisdom. Because let me tell you, if you make, you make decisions based on God's wisdom as a young person, Man, your fruit as you age and get older is going to be amazing. You will reap the benefits, the rewards of those wise decisions in your young years. Those of us over 40 say amen. amen. It is true. You will have much less things that you regret. You know, when you do things God's way, the fruit of wisdom in your life grows over time. And you can see its reward clearly as you age. Submitting to Christ. There's a, um, I don't know if we have it up here. There's a, did you know that, watch what happens to this penny over 30 days. 30 days. Day one, you put one penny in the bank. Day two, if you double it every day, okay? The second day, you have two cents, four cents, eight cents. Doesn't look like it's doing much, right? 
looks pretty stagnant. But look up day 16, now you got $327 in the bank. Look at day 21, now you got 10,000. Wow, that's a, big, that's a big change, right? Look day 27. $671,000. You know, you can have that if you double a penny every day. <laughs> and then day 30, $5,367,709. That's from doubling one penny every day for 30 days. It doesn't look like much in the beginning, right? But man, as it ages, as you get older, it starts to accumulate. It starts to, the reward is there. It's the same way with God's wisdom. Many times when we start out choosing God's wisdom over our wisdom, it doesn't make sense, and it doesn't seem like it's going anywhere. You know, it doesn't seem like it's providing much for us. It may even hurt. It may even struggle a bit. But man, if you keep doing it just like that penny, look at that. $5,367 in 30 days. It works, folks. It works because it's God. It's him. It's not about us. It's about him. And it's about his wisdom. And today I want to encourage you. We seek wisdom in every area of our lives. Wisdom affects how we pay our bills. Wisdom affects how we deal with debt or stay out of debt. Wisdom deals... A, Wisdom, uh, we ask God's wisdom about how to reverse a decline in our business. We ask wisdom about how to resolve challenges with our children. We ask God wisdom about, about how to fix things between you and your spouse, about how to get along with our boss and coworkers. And we, we ask God for wisdom about our future. There's, wisdom touches every area of our life. And so today, I want us to pray that the Lord will help us, will help us seek his wisdom, just like Solomon did, more than anything. Give me wisdom. And you know the cool thing? Solomon asked for wisdom, but he ended up with all those other blessings. It's, it's just like Jesus said, seek what? Seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these other things will be given to you. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to pray this morning. You can just close your eyes and bow your head and pray with me today. We're going to ask the Lord to give us wisdom this week. Ask him to help us not to rely on just our own understanding or maybe what other people tell us. But we need God to, to speak to us. We need to take that time to pray and ask the Lord for his direction in our lives, for his decisions over our lives, and not just our own. Father, we thank you today. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so much. God, you love us. You have a plan for our lives. You have a direction for our lives, Lord. And in even the small decisions, God, you want to be a part of that. Lord, I pray for every person in this room, including myself, that you will give us godly wisdom, that we will seek that even more than anything else, that we will seek your wisdom. We will ask you, Father, that you will just pour out your understanding, your discernment, your ability, Lord, to judge right from wrong into our hearts. Give us this in our hearts today, Father. We desire to please you. We desire, Father, to live a life that is holy, a life that is righteous, a life that is glorifying to you, not just a life we live for ourselves. So help us today. We open our hearts to you, and we say, Holy Spirit, speak to us. We thank you that you are with us and that you will give as we ask and as we pray. In Jesus' name. We hope you enjoyed this message today. If you're ever in the Boston area, please feel free to visit us at Victory Church. We'd love to have you as our guest. And if you need prayer today, you can go to our website and we will pray for you. Go ahead and submit your request online and we have prayer partners that pray for those requests on a weekly basis. Thanks for visiting.